James Lee Jamerson was the bass player on most of the Motown Records hits from the 1960s and the early 70s. He is regarded as one of the most influential bass players of the modern music history. As a session musician, he played on 23 of the Billboard Hot 100 number hit songs, as well as on 56 R&B number one hits. His approach to music has changed the role of bass forever. He elevated the instrument from a time where bass lines mainly consisted of basic roots, fifths and simple patterns to a complex melody-like line that locked in with the groove. I would like you to join me with analyzing and breaking down one of those lines from the tune Darling Dear by the Jackson's Five. Instead of just playing the line note by note, I would like to show you the concept behind this playing, so that will be something you can take with you and apply to your own playing. Part 1. Harmony to understand the bass line, we need to make sure that we first understand the harmony. We are in B flat key, B flat major, and pretty much all the chords that we see in this song are in the key. The first chord that we meet in the verse is C minor 9, which is just a second degree. Then we have an E flat with F in the bass. That's just a different way to write F sus, so it's a pop dominant chord. Then we have a B flat major 7, which is the one chord. Later on we see a D minor 7, so that's a third degree. Um, later we see also D minor triad with A in the bass, which is just a third degree with uh, in a second inversion, right? So the fifth in the bass. And then we see a G minor 7, which is actually just a sixth degree. Part 2, reduction. Not all notes are equal. Not all notes are equal. Some are more important than others and what defines the importance of a note is its rhythmic placement in time. So for example, notes that are on the beat like one, two, three, four are more important than the notes that are on the off beat like one and two and three and four and, right? And that is because we're in a four four time signature that is the pulse of our song and we as bass player, we need to stay true to the harmony. We need to respect it and it's very important for us to be there on those points. And now, if we think of this concept and now apply it to the James Jimerson lines, and we will take his first verse and we will remove all the notes that are not on the beat. Let's hear what we're left off with. <laughs> You can hear that all that's left is roots, fifths and thirds. So you see how strong of a foundation Jamerson had. With all his complexity and all this rhythmical variation he does, he stays true to the purpose of his lines. Even though it sounds a lot like a melody, he still stays exactly all, uh, like true to the harmony and chord, respects it and keeps it sacred, basically. Part 3. Rhythm. Of course, if Jamerson would have played his lines like that, he would not have been known today. The magic happens when you add rhythm. He would often play something called anticipation of the beat. And that means that he would not play on the beat, but a little bit before the beat. So a 16th note tied over uh, before the beat or an 8th note before the beat. So here's a couple of examples. Besides anticipation, he would also use syncopation to create r extra rhythmical diversity. So that means that he would not play all on the beat line, but like a little bit displaced in a way. So he would play in between the beat. And a big thing of his lines is that he would play on the first beat, on the down beat, but then he would not play on, not on beat two, not down on the beat three, but maybe on the beat four or not even that. So often his lines after the first beat do not touch the downbeat. Of course, they do as well, but 
like it's very common for him to be there on the first beat but on the rest is very like um in a way random so just like he would feel like it so he's using a lot of anticipation and syncopation there so here's a few examples of syncopation <laughs> Part 4, Chromaticism. Jamerson used chromaticism much like it's used in jazz music, on a weaker part of the beat and as a way of enforcing the harmony. In the documentary Standing in the Shadows of Motown, you can see that the members of the group Funk Brothers were all actually jazz musicians. So during the day they were recording in Studio A for the Motown records, and in the night they often played jazz gigs because the recordings uh, for the Motown records in the beginning did not pay enough so they were relying on that source of income as well so that just gives me no doubt that all this influence comes from the jazz music now if I say a few things in particular for example he would approach playing let's say a D in a D minor 7 he would play it by playing this chromatic approach from below so he would play a C, C sharp, and then D, okay? And for example, if he would target a C in C minor 7, he would often reach that C by A, B flat, B natural to C. So here's a couple of examples. Part 5, Sound. What makes James Jamerson is the combination of all previously mentioned things together with the sound. Old precision vintage uh, Fender bass and then the flat wound strings that are muted with a short sustain with a, a thicker gauge and of course playing with his uh, one finger with the uh, um, pickup covers, right? And remember he was first an upright bass player so I feel like a lot of his the influence of that he brought to the um, electric bass. If you haven't already, I would highly suggest you to watch the documentary called Standing in the Shadows of Motown. It's here on YouTube and I'll post the link down below. It's a great piece of musical history showing and explaining what the Funk Brothers did in Detroit for Motown records and just awesome, awesome thing to watch. So I'd recommend you that. If you want to learn more about James Jamerson, it's the same title book here that I would recommend. Um, it has a lot written about the Funk Brothers and also about, of course, it's about James Jamerson and it has a bunch of transcriptions of his. Many uh, famous and great bass players contributed to this book. I would highly suggest you, it's a great study material. I am very thankful to my old teacher, Charlie, who recommended it to me. I would also like to thank all my Patreons for support of the channel. They make these kinds of video possible. And I would like to thank you, awesome viewer, for checking out James Jamerson and for sticking out so long into the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.